Alrighty, folks. So th this week I will be talking about the Kalman filter. Uh, actually, just out of my interest, how many of you here in this call have uh, heard of this term before or have worked with it? You can like use the little raise hand thing or you can type in chat. I, I just want to uh, see what my audience is like. Danera, very nice. And Brian too. All right, so this is two out of um, <laughs> two, two out of twelve uh, people who have uh, worked with it before. So for everyone else, uh, this might be uh, uh, this might be a new topic. Let me see. Yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, well, that, that's perfect because this uh, lightning uh, tech talk is going to be uh, sort of an introduction to um, what it is and uh, how it can be used. Now, uh, the term common filter is probably tossed around. Um, pretty frequently in the aerospace industry as well as the autonomous driving industry for a good reason, because this uh, this algorithm allows us to iteratively approximate the state of any given dynamic system. It can be uh, applied more generally. So in this uh, in this uh, tech talk, I'll be talking about the common filter in relation to autonomous driving vehicle, of course. And uh, so in this first slide here, you can see a uh, kind of uh, you can get a feel for a uh, like exactly what we're filtering. So on the graph over uh, over to the left, you can see that our estimation will kind of reject the the noisy, uh, the noise or the uh, deviation in the actual sensor measurement. And we are able to converge to, uh, if you can see very faintly in the middle, like this kind of uh, solid like cyan line, It um, our estimation always lies pretty close to that, uh, despite the fact that our measurement appears to be very, very noisy. And over on the right, this is just to illustrate how um, uh, uh, later later on when we uh, dive into like the specifics about how like a linear common filter would work. Let's just keep in mind that the common filter belongs uh, in a family of Bayesian filters. So it uses Bayesian statistics as well as uh, 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 Gaussian distributions for approximating all our uh, measurements, uh, not only in, my, in our process, but also um, we also have this assumption for our sensors as well. And when you have uh, kind of two uh, normal distributions and you multiply them together, you will always find a, uh, uh, you will always yield a third uh, distribution distribution function that has a slight, um, slightly less, um, uh, that has a uh, less standard deviation than either of the two operands that you began with, which is the advantage of such common filter. All right, let's go to the next slide. So to quickly point out uh, exactly where like the state uh, estimation happens, uh, not only in our autonomous driving stack, but in most uh, autonomous driving stacks out there. So over here, we have a diagram illustrating our very own autonomous driving stack. So over from the left, we collect data, of course, from our uh, from our radar and LIDAR. We harvest a point cloud um, from these sensors. And from the camera, it will first pass through a, it will pass, first pass through uh, these two detection models, actually, to extract the bounding box information out of the uh, out of you know the regions of interest in that camera, so where the pedestrians are, where the traffic signs are, etc. And then we will uh, we will pro we'll take those information, so the point cloud data as well as this uh, as well as the bounding box information, and perform some sort of sensor fusion. Uh, now the exact pre-processing or clustering algorithm we used before object tracking is uh, uh, is uh, unknown to me at the moment. But what we want to focus on during this tech talk is the filtering part. So as you can imagine, once we have appropriately uh, clustered or selected the uh, like the quote unquote correct uh, the correct measurement out of our uh, noisy data. So first rejecting a lot of the uh, a lot of the noises that detect, for example, the uh, I want to say the curve of the road, but that might end up being useful. But uh, as you can see, as you can imagine, we are only interested in the kind of data that's centered around where the previous tracks were. So around where we thought uh, the pedestrian proof previously was, and so um, so is for the other vehicles. All right, let's move on to the next slide and finally dig into the maths of the linear common filter. So for this tech talk, I'd like to choose um, a sort of intuitive approach uh, about uh, understanding exactly what happens during all these uh, during all these steps that happens um, uh, within one iteration of the common filter. Because <laughs> frankly, um, uh, one of the uh, the one of the research project where I, I guess because I'm an undergrad, it's not really research, more like a literature review uh, for one of my courses, uh, which is signals, is to understand 
you know, kind of what's happening in a common filter. So I can't put to, I can't give you guys a rigorous uh, derivation for, you know, ex exactly how a inverse of a matrix is allows you to allows you to compute the uh, uh, allows you to compute like this kind of uh, convolution. Of, well, not really convolution, but the the kind of product between two distributions, uh, like you saw on the first slide. But at least we can kind of understand what these terms are doing. Okay, so let's start with the very first. Let's assume that we start this um, uh, we start this uh, kind of state diagram with uh, this entry on the left. So we say, you know, we put on some initial estimates for uh, or initial guesses for where the state of the system is, as well as what we think the what we think the covariance matrix for the for that state is. Now, when when you hear the ter the term covariance covariance matrix. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with stats, you will know that this is how how much each variable is uh, kind of related to the other. So uh, you can uh, kind of, if you recall from experience, when we have a covariance value of zero, that means these two variables are not correlated at all. When we have a covariance value of one, that would be uh, pos perfectly positively correlated and so forth for negative one, which is perfectly negatively correlated. So in this case, what we are interested in in this uh, covariance matrix would be the covariance value of any given variable with respect to itself, aka that would just be the uh, standard deviation of that of that particular metric. And when I say metric here, it will be um, uh, any element in our uh, in our state, uh, which I will <laughs> I will call this uh, vector space the the state space from now on. Okay, so uh, sorry we kind of jumped around uh, to p there, but let's start with the first step. So in this uh, particular set of notations that I've chosen <laughs> from the internet, uh, x hat x hat k is the uh, is a notation we use to indicate the state uh, the uh, the current state of the dynamic system as a column vector at iteration k, and then I think the hat is just to denote that this is a column vector uh, instead of, um, uh, for example, with the capital letters where they uh, often denote uh, matrices. And as you can see, uh, I believe this is uh, whoever rendered this uh, picture, uh, I guess could not have um, uh, could not have like a superscript that's uh, that looks more like a, a hypostrophe. But if you see this little floating kind of minus sign that's on the top there, this is used to distinguish the difference between. Yes, thank you, Victor. This is uh, the uh, distinguish uh, the difference between what's known as a prior. So uh, the kind of um, x hat k that we're calculating now and the uh, act x hat k that we calculate later, which will become our state estimate. Now, let me uh, explain what prior means. So in this first equation over here, we see that we multiply the previous, the, uh, the estimated state of the previous, of the previous iteration k minus one. Uh, we multiply this column vector by a, uh, what, what we call, or what I, what I like to call a state transition matrix A. This describes, uh, this describes the existing knowledge we know about this dynamic system, so aka uh, vehicles, about how we can use the previous estimation and make a prediction about where the uh, state is going to be. So more specifically, you can imagine a very simple kinematics model where given the previous um, the previous position, the previous velocity, as well as the previous acceleration, you can use your uh, kind of high school kinematics to say, OK, so over the span of you know uh, one to five milliseconds, we can multiply that by the uh, previous uh, uh, velocity, multiply that one half times the previous acceleration and then times t squared, etc. This will give you a nice prediction about where you think the uh, the next state of that uh, of that system is. So in this case, it might be individual individual vehicles, you know, our ego vehicle or pedestrians. And uh, over to the right, we can see another uh, we can see another term that's denoted as buk. Now u here, I believe, uh, is another should be another uh, vector denoting the controls. Uh, that we're uh, giving into uh, such system. And of course, this control will be applied to the current step K. And similarly, uh, you can derive the same idea, right? So given some control uh, command you give to the system, combined with your existing knowledge about the dynamic system, you can perform a prediction of, um, of what the uh, next iteration is going to be, if I re repeat myself. Now, uh, if you remember, if you still remember how I talked about, we, we call this term a prior. Well, this is because we simply combine our prior knowledge about the system, right? So you already have some known control action. You have some known uh, known information about how this system is going to convolve forwards. Sorry, uh, revolve forwards, uh, how it's going to proceed forwards. So that's why we uh, 
That's why we call this the prior term. Now, after calculating the prior term, you have updated, you kind of uh, made a prediction on your state there, but we still we still like to correlate the uh, like the, the kind of accuracy. Yes, accuracy is a good term. So we like to keep track of the accuracy of the term that we have just done, uh, of the result that we have just obtained, especially because we're going to mix it up with the uh, with a, a measurement uh, competence or accuracy later when we combine it with the actual sensor input. So over here we have uh, we have this uh, operation, you know, AP K minus one uh, multiplied by A transpose plus Q. So here uh, we're using the same uh, kind of state transition uh, matrix A. We multiply that by the previous covariance matrix. Now, just focusing on this first step uh, makes a lot of sense, right? You will, you essentially perform like the kind of same linear transformation you applied to your previous state on the previous uh, covariance uh, matrix to get like a, uh, to get like a rough idea about where, uh, about how your uh, how your prediction has changed the previous covariance values, uh, and I have to be frank with you, I don't particularly know what um, uh, uh, what the purpose is uh, to multiply it by a transpose later. If any of you are the expert on the matter, feel free to <laughs> unmute your mic or type in the chat. But let's focus on um, uh, let's move on to the term after that. So we use Q to denote the uh, like the kind of process noise of this. Um, uh, of our prediction step. So as you can imagine, in uh, in complex, uh, in real world scenarios, often the dynamic systems themselves are complex, right? So let's say that we just want to use the linear common filter without, uh, we just want to use the linear common filter because of its, um, because it's quick to compute and it's uh, relatively easy to understand. But oftentimes in those real world scenarios, our dynamic systems cannot be described as a, uh, or like its state transition cannot be described as a linear process. Therefore, if you're going to try to uh, fit your transition using a linear process anyways, you're going to end up with some errors, right? So sometimes um, those errors are small enough that you can get away with. So this Q term is exactly that. You will add this Q term to your, uh, to the kind of updated covariance, uh, to the um, covariance matrix that has been updated. Uh, sorry, that has that has your new predictions to kind of correct uh, to kind of correct how much noise that you uh, how much new noise you have introduced to the covariance um, matrix as a result of your prediction as a result of your prediction not having the fullest uh, fidelity. Oh, by the way, um, I, if I'm going too fast, please uh, raise your hand or type in the chat so that I can slow down and explain some of the things. Otherwise, you can save your questions at the end. That works too. Now this is how we calculate. Um, uh, again, you use the you see the kind of uh, the same notation p prime or yeah p prime k. Let's just call it that. So now we have a covariance matrix that has the updated covariance values for our prediction step. Okay, next we're going to move on to how exactly we use the uh, we use both the knowledge of our existing system and the fresh sensor data that we have collected together to form a a more accurate and uh, robust measurement of the uh, of the system altogether. Now, uh, going to the first step again, we see <laughs> we see this very scary looking term in indeed. So this term known as the Kalman game, which is yet another matrix uh, in the linear Kalman filter anyways, will be, you know, P prime uh, P prime K times <laughs> H transpose. I'm just reading the formula now. Uh, HP prime K H transpose plus R um, inverted. Uh, that's delightful. So let's break down this argument. Uh, let's break down this expression a little bit by focusing on the uh, the resulting matrix that we're inverting. So you might think that this uh, that this term looks very similar to the one uh, we have on the left when we uh, when we got our uh, you know kind of the uh, when we updated our covariance uh, matrix according to the 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 quote unquote prediction noise or the process noise. Well, you'd be correct because uh, at least uh, to my to intuitively, this is exactly what you're doing with, um, instead of the known process, now you're doing it with the sensors. So let me explain the uh, the kind of notation we're using here. Uh, so P, we're acquainted with that. This is the covariance matrix. H is what's known as the measurement function. So this is the function that maps your that maps your state space. So remember that vector space I called state state space. That uh, that is the space, uh, you know your uh, your dynamics uh, systems state uh, exists in 
So of course, all the elements here are the metrics that you that you want to keep track of or you're interested in. And uh, here to to translate uh, to uh, to transform from your state space into the measurement space, uh, obviously you need some sort of uh, mapping for that. And in the linear common filter, uh, surprise surprise, it's a, yet another linear transformation. So we would use kind of like this um, uh, this measurement function multiplied by kind of your prior uh, your prior uh, covariance uh, matrix, and then we add it with yet another uh, matrix that denotes just about how much noise you can expect from our sensors. So before we had Q, which is the process noise, and now we have the, sorry, uh, before we had Q, which is the process noise, now we have R, which is the sensor noise. So these two terms together, uh, they kind of uh, quantify how inaccurate uh, you know, your process is or how inaccurate your sensor is. And with this fancy uh, inverse operation and multiplied by a couple of extra terms, uh, I think this, uh, you can uh, intuitively think that the common game will have, uh, will, uh, the common game will kind of quantify exactly how much you can trust the sensors. So uh, exactly how much you like to uh, correct your prediction based on, uh, based on your inputs. So now let's move on to the actual uh, update step. Now this should also look uh, pretty similar to the prediction step we had before. You know, we're simply adding another, we're simply adding another, uh, uh, like a correction term to the to the state estimation. So over here we have, you know, the Kalman gain term that we have just calculated multiplied by z. Now z is uh, the uh, z is the uh, measurement vector denoting, you know, all the all the measurements that we just we have just taken off off of the sensors. So you know we take the difference between between the uh, the measurement taken uh, subtracted by you know the uh, our me measurement function multiplied by the by the uh, by the state vector. So now we are talking about the uh, the measurement space. So we're taking the difference first in how much um, how much our measurement differs from what we expect it to be, and then we multiply that by the Kalman gain. Right, so here you can. This is almost analogous to a uh, to a to a, a scalar operation, where you know we take some known errors, you know, in st statistics, mostly known as resi residual, right? So we take a residual, and then we multiply this by some sort of corrective term, so that we can kind of limit how much um, how much our residual is going to change our answer. So in this case, how much we like to we like to correct our prediction using sensor sensor data. And of course, we multiply, we add that with our uh, the state vector from uh, from our you know using our prior knowledge, the, aka the prior the prior state. And this is how we get the the next state of our dy dynamic system. And finally, uh, last but not least, remember what we did for the prediction step. Now we should do it for the uh, for this quote unquote correction step as well. So we like to update our covariance matrix based on you know how much more more noise that we have just accumulated in our uh, more, or I should say less in the optimal case, how much how much error we have reduced by um, kind of multiplying these two uh, distributions together, roughly speaking. And over here, uh, as we can see, we have the identity matrix, uh, subtract the uh, the common gain term we have just computed, uh, multiplied by the measurement function, and all together uh, multiplied by our quote unquote prior covariance uh, matrix. And this is how you get the next step in the, uh, this is how you get your new covariance uh, matrix, aka a measurement of how, uh, of how accurate your estimation is. All right, uh, I know that I, uh, sorry, I may have rambled a little bit there. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please ask them now. Here's where I have some uh, fun things to show you guys in a moment. All right, I'll take this silence as a uh, solid thumbs up. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, Victor, let's go to the next slide. Very cool. All right, so here are some of the uh, kind of simulated results to uh, to validate my uh, uh, an implementation I've done a while ago when I was doing UAUT. So here uh, we have, you know, uh, I have made up some uh, procedurally generated noise, of course, also based on the um, 
a, a normal distribution. So here is um, here should only be a demonstration to show you guys what the optimal uh, situation looks like. So the the noisy input um, shown as a dashed red line in the in these two graphs are uh, unfortunately not uh, real data. So here uh, I'm only showing you like kind of how the common filter would converge itself. So as you can see at the beginning, we start with our initial uh, guess that's not so accurate, but that's okay because over time using uh, using the uh, using the uh, state transition, so like our the known information about the dynamic system, as well as how the covariance uh, matrix would naturally get smaller, uh, like it's in terms of the magnitude of its uh, each of its elements will naturally get smaller over time, and thus will give you a answer that actually converges to what the mean of my uh, of my dummy input data is. So over here, I have just simply done um, these two uh, these two input data of uh, I guess a little bit of um, uh, at a different magnitude, but uh, you can see how the filter performs, uh, how the filter will converge to where the mean is, and it will not get uh, affected by the uh, by the sensor noise so much, and thus will yield you a more stable and more trustworthy prediction for your uh, you know uh, planning algorithms to work with, for example. Right? Uh, I think this part makes sense. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Uh, do you think you could expand on some uh, applications of this, like uh, where in the uh, autonomous, I guess you explained previously the autonomous stack, but like in the actual yeah. vehicle, like which scenarios would this benefit the car the most? Sure. Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, sorry. I think I think my uh, introduction was a little too short there. Now, uh, Rudolf Kalman came up with it, this uh, like iterative implementation, or uh, if you look on Wikipedia, this is recursive because in order to get the previous state, you have to know its previous state and so on. So this iterative slash recursive implementation of a Bayesian filter uh, came out of the need in the aerospace industry. So on a rocket, as you can imagine, uh, even with um, uh, uh, even with the technology today, not to mention the sensors in the 60s, uh, to collect data to uh, to calculate, you know, the altitude of your rocket as well as the uh, velocity is pretty difficult, right? Especially when your data fluctu fluctuates like the, uh, especially when your when your sensor measurement fluctuates like the red dashed lines you see in these two graphs. So what he came, the, this is the method that he came up with. So using uh, using the power of statistics and linear algebra, he was able to. Uh, formulate exactly how we would combine both our knowledge of the dynamic system as well as our uh, kind of known characteristics of the sensors to um, to yield a, a robust and uh, a robust and fairly accurate estimation of what the true state is. So its applications include, uh, you know, if so, in terms of uh, rocketry, uh, you guys probably have launched watched the SpaceX launches, for example, right? So in order to calculate exactly when you need to you know, detach your thrust uh, thrusters and um, uh, start doing performing maneuvers. You know, to start um, to instead of accelerating straight up, you know, you need some you know side thrusters to uh, to change the heading of your rocket so that it starts to you know go into all kinds of orbits around Earth. So in order to perform these actions, your behavior algorithm needs to have a pre precise answer about where the state, what the state of the system is, aka how high the rocket is, for example. So this is where uh, this is a scenario where you need a accurate measurement because, as you can imagine, um, and I think most of the people here have done a robotics project at some point, right? So uh, you probably you're probably acquainted with a uh, with a process known as debouncing when you're dealing with uh, you know user inputs that involves buttons or uh, any sort of sensors that crosses a certain threshold because due to the fluctuations in the sensors, you have to kind of desensitize them. The threshold condition of whatever decision algorithm you're making, such that uh, you know the fluctu the natural fluctuations due to the imperfection in the sensor does not affect your uh, actual output. So in our case, you know if we're trying to detect the velocity of a pedestrian, you <laughs> ideally you would not want your pedestrian to be uh, measured at you know one meter per second to the left, and then all of a sudden in the next iteration it becomes 0 0.2 meters per second, and then in the third iteration becomes 1.5 meters per second, right? Because we cannot determine 
exactly when our autonomous vehicle needs to stop to wait for the pedestrian. So this uh, for these safety critical features such as you know adaptive uh, cruise control, uh, uh, pedestrian avoidance, etc. We need robust and uh, non fluctuating uh, non fluctuating uh, metrics, and this is where the common filter comes in, right? It filters out the the noise. Uh, answer does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, thanks a lot. So from what I understand, what from what I understand, uh, the main goal is just to reduce the fluctuations and variance that you get um, from like real world sensors and be able to um, interpret that data and create more accurate measurements. Exactly. Very cool. I know, right? Some next level stuff. OK, um, any questions from anyone else? Uh, I just want to add that in all the race, we're actively solving these kind of problems. Currently, we're working on um, uh, using a common filter to uh, clean up the GPS data that we come in. The, uh, the GPS driver that we're using provides a, um, a implementation of, of this, but they didn't take into account how much vibration there is on, on the car. And um, we're trying to take, uh, instead of using the uh, implementation from the driver, we're trying to uh, write our own common filter to estimate the position of the vehicle. Uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so see guys, Water Race is doing some cool stuff. If you're interested, reach out to Ben immediately. <laughs> True, shameless, shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Yeah, sorry I couldn't uh, attend the uh, talk for when, when we had the slides up uh, for Water Race. Uh, but oh oh no, we're deviating from the topic. <laughs> Even I'll let you finish, and then we'll uh, I'll do a brief plug of our water race. Sounds good, sounds good. Yeah, I just have a little bit to finish. So yeah, uh, yeah Victor, let's go to the last slide. All right, so now let's talk about how we use the common filter in um, on the water side of things. Uh, now the tracker of choice in our uh, object tracker, uh, Ross node, is uh, is a library that's called a 3D MOT or the 3D uh, multi object tracker developed by um, uh, pro provided by, should, should I say Dr. Mung? Dr. Wong, she's a, a PhD candidate from uh, MCU in the Robotics Institute. So in her uh, research, this is the uh, implementation that she has provided along with her paper. And we have taken the fork that has someone else's created off of this and uh, made our own filter this way. But regardless, in this 3D MOT that she wrote, she also uses a linear common filter to uh, perform to perform state estimation of the uh, of the uh, location, or I should say the 3D bounding boxes of the subjects, as you can see in the uh, top picture over here. Sadly, Google Slides does not display uh, GIFs correctly. This is supposed to animate. <laughs> uh, but as you can see, so this is, again, an, another application of the common filter. And down below, I've shown I've shown two snippets that's, that are in our uh, current uh, perception, perception stack. You know, these are the two kind of uh, matrix, matrices we talked about before. Uh, using a slightly different notation. So F will be the A we just uh, mentioned, and H is still H, our uh, measurement matrix. matrix. Uh, all right, yeah, just to show you how this is relevant to us and how we use it. Uh, th thanks, everyone. That's uh, all the things I'd like to talk about today.